Hello, history students. Welcome back to part two of our discussion of turning the tides of war in the Pacific. In this video lecture, we will look at the ways in which the war are going to come to a conclusion thanks to the atomic bombs. But were they really necessary? That is the question that we will be faced with as we put Harry S. Truman on trial for potential war crimes in the ending of this war against Japan. First, let's look at why Harry S. Truman is the man that is in charge. As of April 1945, President Franklin D. Roosevelt will die in the middle of his fourth term. This tremendous history maker did an incredible job with the Great Depression, the New Deal, and fighting in World War II, but he will have a brain aneurysm that will cause him to die in April of 1945. Now, this will bring to power the uh, vice president, Harry S. Truman. And Harry S. Truman, fun fact about Harry S. Truman, by the way, S is his middle name, okay? He does not have a middle name, but just S is the middle name. Isn't that interesting? So Harry S. Truman comes to power now as the new president of the United States. And I want you to keep in mind how difficult of a job um, it would have been for Truman because he'd been basically left out of all of the military aspects of being commander in chief. He had really no knowledge of most of the important strategic things that FDR was up to. And you know what else, else he did not know about? was the atomic bomb, knew nothing about the Manhattan Project, knew nothing about the research being done uh, into the creation of this ultimate weapon of mass destruction. So on day one of being president, he finds out, number one, you've got the hardest job in the world. Number two, we are about to engage in the bloodiest conflict in American history called the Battle of Okinawa. And number three, there's a Manhattan Project working, working on a weapon of mass destruction of which no one has ever seen. So let's start with the Typhoon of Steel, AKA the Battle of Okinawa. This is one of the most heroic moments in the history of the US Marine Corps and they take great pride in it as they should, unlike what we saw with the Battle of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was a small island with a defense force of military men, but very few civilians whatsoever on Iwo Jima. They fired more bombs in Iwo Jima than America used in all of World War I combined. But unlike Iwo Jima, Okinawa is this huge island which has a, hu a, a tremendous uh, civilian presence as well. And the Japanese military is going to use that against their own people. From April to June of 1945, we see the worst battle in American history because of the tremendous amount of death. They call it a typhoon of steel because there's so many bullets flying around everywhere. You just don't, I mean, it felt like a typhoon of bullets. The Japanese military is going to take women and strap bombs to their chest and threaten these women with the death of their children, for instance, if they don't walk out to the American soldiers. From these kinds of both war tactics and war criminal tactics of killing these civilians, uh, the Americans are going to lose 72,000 men over the course of this just over a month and a half of fighting in Okinawa. The civilian casualties are tremendous as well. 140,000 civilians killed or wounded in this one island. But we started to see a large amount of civilians that were actually surrendering to the Americans that would flee to the Americans for protection as we were invading. And we'd never seen that before in, in the history of this war. And it's something I want you to keep in mind as we debate the necessary or unnecessary aspect of the atomic bombs. By this stage of the war, June of 1945, the Japanese in some ways are starting to realize that they're losing and that there's no way that they can win. We'll get to what that implies with the emperor and his war machine in a moment, but the civilians certainly are starting to realize that and many of them are going to surrender. Now, some of the Japanese military at Okinawa are even going to surrender because, again, they saw a lost cause. So it was not the one-to-one -one ratio that we anticipated in Okinawa like we'd seen at Iwo Jima but we still had tremendous losses. And while that's going on, let's jump back over to Europe for a moment, okay? The uh, death knell of fascism is going to come first for Benito Mussolini. In April of 1945, Mussolini is going to be captured by resistance partisan fighters. You heard that Pino Lella is going to be a part of this, and he will witness the history of what will happen to Mussolini and his uh, his mistress and then many of his leaders. Okay, as, this, as Italy is deteriorating into a literal civil war, war in which you've got 
partisan fighters, fighting against fascist Salo Republic supporters, fighting against um, the Nazis as well as they're trying to leave from Italy. And then you've got uh, the people that are just caught in the middle of all of this. As all of that death and turmoil is taking place, Mussolini is going to be captured. He will be beaten up by the resistance forces, then tied by the ankles to a car that will drag him back to Milan, where they will murder him and hang him from a pole. I mean, his face was unrecognizable because they had uh, bashed in his face with so many boot kicks. But then next, if we take a look at the situation in Berlin, Hitler is going to order that Berlin be defended to the last man. Now, as you saw from watching Jojo Rabbit, you could see that as things deteriorate in Berlin, there's not much of a man left, okay? They're using old men who are too old to fight in the Wehrmacht, or they are using children that aren't even shaving yet. And they're running around with bazookas and machine guns, taking on Soviet and American tanks. And so a lot of children are going to die in these last few weeks of the war. Hitler, meanwhile, is down below Berlin, in the, uh, below the streets of Berlin, in the thing that he called his Führer bunker. And he is hoping at all costs that something will turn around for him and that he will end up still winning in this war. However, that will not be the case. And he'll start to realize that uh, after his birthday on April 20th, uh, 10 days later, on April the 30th, he and his mistress, longtime mistress Ava Braun, are going to have a somber wedding celebration in the Furen bunker. Joseph Goebbels will be there. All of these high commanders will be there to celebrate this wedding. They'll sip some champagne and then with with that champagne, they're going to drink down a couple of cyanide capsules. Now, the Nazi policy was you can't trust the cyanide capsules to do their suicidal duties that they're supposed to. So after popping the capsule, you're supposed to also shoot yourself in the head. Well, by all reports, that is if we're to believe the reports that Hitler did die here and did not escape somehow, Hitler gave Ava Braun her pill, she took it, and then he shot her. And then he took his own pill and shot himself. And the Soviets are going to claim that they showed up and uh, they were the ones that actually got to kill Hitler. They got him before he could get to himself. And they are going to uh, spread around a little rumor, a little conspiracy theory that they actually took his body, brought it back to Moscow and buried it beneath the Kremlin. However, the Germans Germans will claim that Hitler killed himself and that they then burned the body so that no one could get a hold of it. There are, of course, other theories that he escaped to Argentina and has never been found. You believe what you want, but either way, Hitler is dead, or we think, and the war is coming to a conclusion. So May the 2nd, Berlin falls to the Soviets, and so this will be the end of the war in Europe. Because at this point, the German high command has no ability to continue fighting, so on May the 8th, May the 8th is actually a Victory Europe Day, when all of the war is completely over at that point. And now there's some interesting th things that are popping up here. Because as we look at the picture that you see here, this is the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, and the Soviets are proudly flying their communist flag there. One of the really big considerations we need to look at as we're looking at the dropping of the atomic bombs and its justification or lack thereof has to do with the situation in Europe. The war in the Pacific is still going on and will continue all the way until August of 1945. And we will see tremendous losses over those next few months in the Pacific theater. But the Soviet Union is not yet at war with Japan. But here they are occupying Eastern Europe and they so show no sign of wanting to give Eastern Europe back, including this chunk of Germany that they have now conquered. Now that will get more and more complicated as we move along, but let's look at what the Americans are up to next. You see, for the last few years, the Americans, thanks to Albert Einstein, who had told us that the Germans were working on an atomic bomb, uh, the Japanese in the 1930s had also been working on an atomic bomb, although most scientists agreed that it was simply not possible to create something like this. So the Americans had been working on a project called the Manhattan Project. A lot of the scientists that were a part of the Manhattan Project were actually scientists who escaped from Europe during uh, the Holocaust and during the occupation of these fascist forces. Guys like Enrico Fermi, famous physicists from around the world, fled to America to, uh, to help us to win this war, but also hoping that this power that they thought they could create could be used for the benefit of the world rather than a weapon of mass destruction. 
So the Manhattan Project uh, did some some practice runs, you could say, where they were t waiting to see can they do the necessary phys physical elements to split the atom. And they practiced this actually in Chicago. I want you to think about the craziness of this story. Enrico Fermi is going to be the head scientist of this particular aspect of the Manhattan Project that in Chicago went to the University of Illinois and they, they were in the gymnasium and they had this giant machine set up to see can they balance without creating a huge explosion that could destroy the entire city of Chicago. Can we split the atom without blowing everybody up? Like a controlled splitting of the atom. If so, that means we could take that next step into the creation of a bomb. So they did it, and it almost blew up the entire city of Chicago. But once they saw that they could do it, they knew there was a way to create a bomb. So fast forward a couple years, and now we've got the Manhattan Project creating a bomb in what was called the Trinity Test. The leader of the Trinity Test and the leader of the project at this point is a culturally German scientist, but who was living in America and was teaching at the University of Southern California. His name is Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. He has with him a man named Leslie Groves. General Leslie Groves is the military head of, the, of this aspect of the project. So a physicist and a general working together with hundreds of scientists across the United States in absolute top secret, um, top secret clearance kind of activity and spending over $2 billion without anyone knowing what that money is going towards. Congress doesn't know what any of this is about, but they just keep having to sign the checks saying, sure, spend it on the war, whatever you got to do. So J. Robert Oppenheimer and Leslie Groves performed their first test of the uh, atomic bombs in the Trinity test at Alamogordo Desert in New Mexico in July of 1945. Harry S. Truman at that moment was over in Potsdam, Germany, wrapping up the end of the war in Europe by talking it over with the allies of Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin at this time. And he's waiting for news of how did the test go. When they tested this bomb, you can see the desert down below. It had a blast that blew a giant hole in the desert, but it also created over that, that blast radius a sheet of glass. The heat was so intense that it was the same temperature as the surface of the sun, and it created the, the desert into a sheet of glass in that blast zone. And when J. Robert Oppenheimer witnessed the success of this test, he said, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So what he was doing was quoting the Bhagavad Gita, and he, the, the essence of that quote is that he recognizes just how powerful this thing really is. Now, the other scientists that are going to witness the effectiveness and powerful aspects of this bomb, some of them were really scared. They said, okay, well, we tested it. That was good. Now what we should do is not use it on people because this would destroy an entire city indiscriminately killing everyone that is within its blast zone, not to mention the long-term effects. All right, you might make, try to make the argument that the scientists didn't know what these atomic bombs would do to people. They knew. Okay, Marie Curie and her husband died from radiation poisoning, and the radioactivity that is emitted from this bomb very clearly shows the scientists that this will kill people not just with the explosion, but with long-term effects of radiation and cancer afterward. So this is dangerous on so many different levels. It was so dangerous that there was a group of people called the Chicago Scientists who actually got together and wrote a letter to the president and signed it, specifically asking him not to use this bomb against humans, but instead to use it to uh, build power plants and, and use this, this power uh, as a leader for the world, but not to use it against humans. However, that is not really on the mind of President Truman right now, of using this as a that kind of positive for the world kind of thing right now. He needs to keep it top secret because what he wants to do is use it as a weapon. This weapon was originally intended to be used against the Germans, but the war ended against Germany. So now the weapon, that is now that it's ready and the war continues in the, in the Pacific, Truman hears about it and decides this needs to be used against Japan at its earliest possible moment. So he'll find out uh, about this thing before July 25th of 1945, roughly around July 20th is when he gets the news. So he's sitting in Potsdam, which is just outside of Berlin, Germany, and Harry S. Truman, 
uh, was feeling a little bit out of place because he was talking to Stalin, who's this dictator who's been in power for a long time. He's been winning the war against Germany. Winston Churchill, who everybody knows is this ultimate world leader. Harry S. Truman at this point is an untested political figure. He's certainly not in as strong of a position as FDR was as commander in chief. But then he finds out that he's got the atomic bomb. And he s said in his diary that uh, this is an ace up his sleeve that he can use in his discussion with Stalin and Winston Churchill. So when he found out that the bomb was effectively tested, Harry S. Truman spoke to Winston Churchill and said, you know, I've got this bomb that can destroy an entire city. It's a pretty big deal. And Winston Churchill already knew about the Manhattan Project long before Harry S. Truman ever did. And he said, okay, I hope you use it. Truman is also going to mention this to Joseph Stalin and just kind of whisper it to him. He doesn't want him to know the details. He just says, you know, I've got a weapon that could help us destroy Japan if we need to really, really quickly. And uh, Stalin said, yeah, yeah, good for you. Hope you use it. Here's the thing. Stalin had been spying on the Manhattan Project for years. He had scientists that he'd already paid off that are in the Manhattan Project that know all about it. So a really key component of whether or not to use this bomb could have to do with the Soviet Union and whether or not Harry S. Truman was hoping to intimidate them. Stalin already knew about the bomb. He was trying to make his own. Truman and the American planners that are making this bomb don't want Stalin to get it. They don't want him to have his hands on it. That's a really important thing to think about when using this bomb after what's called the Potsdam Declaration. You see, the Potsdam Declaration is this moment where the Allies said to Japan, you are going to face prompt and utter destruction unless you surrender right now. Here's the thing. The Soviet Union is not at war yet with Japan. Stalin promised Truman, we will declare war on Japan on September the 15th of 1945 if this war is still going on. We will do it at that point and then we will invade Japan and it will be the end of them. So let's say that Truman decided not to use the atomic bombs, then the planned invasion of Japan would take place in November of 1945. We were hoping to wait until November because by then the Soviet Union would have declared war on Japan as well and the uh, Japanese had already made it clear through their diplomatic envoys to the Soviets that in the event that the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, their war would be over. They were re almost prepared to surrender. More on that in a second. Let's just look at what the United States was planning in the event of Japan not surrendering. So November 1st is the Operation Downfall planned invasion. They would have to attack at a place called Kyushu, which is where the majority of Japanese soldiers were. And then they would also have to attack across the Tokyo Plain. Remember that Tokyo had been firebombed to the point where around 60% of the city had been destroyed at this point. There was not a lot of areas for the Japanese to be able to defend any more, but hidden away somewhere in uh, around Tokyo, of course, is the emperor. And so the goal is to get in on that territory as soon as they can. But the planned invasion meant that there was a good chance that our men could lose as many as 100 to 130,000 men. We could lose that many people trying to invade mainland Japan. Now, that's a pretty low estimate. There are higher estimates, and when you're doing your reading, you might hear that some people are saying that it will save the lives of a million Americans or five million Americans. The fact is we don't know because we didn't try it. So we don't know what those numbers could have been, either high or low. We just know that it would have been bad for both sides. Now, there are other options, though, that were available besides just the atomic bombs. One of those would be to wait for Japan to surrender while still pressuring them with firebombing and through a naval blockade. You see, Hirohito, Emperor Hirohito, uh, we knew from spies and also from the uh, communications that had taken place between Japan and neutral intermediaries in Switzerland and the Soviet Union. We knew that Hirohito was already planning to surrender after the fall of Okinawa. Once he saw the dramatic death tolls and the ability of the Americans to just keep fighting through Okinawa and Iwo Jima, Hirohito was working on a plan to surrender. The problem is his Supreme War Council did not want to allow him to do it. These guys are a bunch of old samurais and 
They wanted to fight with the Bushido Code until the death, and so they were split. It was a 50-50 split of those that wanted to continue the war and those that wanted to stop the war with a surrender. The biggest thing that was causing them to split, though, was the fact that they had to guarantee that Hirohito would remain in power. The reason they want him to remain in power is he is the god of the Japanese people. I mean, if someone defeats your country in war and then takes away your god, too... That would be the ultimate destruction, and you could argue a genocidal kind of thing because it is removing uh, part of their culture. So they don't, they don't want to lose Hirohito. Hirohito is going to send his chief cabinet secretary, a man by the name of Hisatsune Sakumizu, to discuss with the Soviets the possibility of the Soviet Union staying neutral and then acting as a neutral interme intermediary between the Japanese and the Americans. Um, and he wants to get that discussion going. All right, when you read the report of Hisatsune Sekumizu, you can see that uh, he says that there was no way the Japanese could have continued fighting for more than another month or two. They were all out of, uh, their air force was destroyed, they were out of ships, they were out of food. There was so many things to indicate that there's no way they can keep fighting. So maybe one of the president's best options is to wait, to simply wait for this war to end and to allow the Japanese to come to their senses. That's a possibility, isn't it? But at the same time, we could have also waited for the Russian declaration of war. The Russians we knew would, would uh, declare war on September the 15th of 1945. And we knew from cracking the Japanese code that it, they were communicating with each other that if the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, they were done for and they planned to surrender at that point. But would it have been a conditional surrender? What a conditional surrender means is that uh, the Japanese would be asking for something, like for instance, keeping the emperor or keeping their military intact or not being occupied by the Americans. And that's something that the Americans simply saw as unacceptable at this point. Just look at the conditions facing Japan by August of 1945 when we will drop the atomic bombs. 60 of their cities had been destroyed to a point where there's really, I mean, just nothing but rubble left. They had sustained millions and millions of deaths over the course of the last four years of this global conflict against the United States. They were at a moment where Japan was faced with, with massive famine and starvation conditions because nothing was going in, in or out of Japan and there was no food production that was going on on a level that could actually feed their soldiers. You see, the United States had surrounded Japan with a naval blockade and they didn't. the Japanese did not have the Navy or the Air Force to be able to fight back. So yeah, they might have soldiers in Japan, and yes, they had soldiers in China as well, but those guys are cut off and they are at the brink of starvation, as is their civilian population. In fact, there's plenty of evidence to indicate that had we done nothing except keep the naval blockade in place and just let the Japanese figure it out for themselves, as many as 10 million people could have starved to death between August and January of 1945. Should we have just let them figure it out for themselves while we surrounded them? Maybe. That's possible. The U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey said, certainly prior to the 1st of November 1945, which was the planned invasion of Japan, Japan would have surrendered, even if the bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no invasion had been planned or contemplated. So the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey after the war was analyzing what Japan was faced with in 1945 and the effectiveness of our bombs, and they said even without the bombs, it wouldn't have made a difference. They were going to surrender. So should that come up in our trial? Admiral William Leahy was one of the strategic planners for the U.S. Navy at this point, and he said, It is my opinion that the use of the barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender because of the effective sea blockade and the successful bombing with conventional weapons, meaning firebombing and air raids. Meanwhile, General Leslie Groves of the Manhattan Project said, There was never from about two weeks from the time I I took charge of this project, any illusion on my part, but that Russia was our enemy and the project was conducted on that basis. Keep in mind in our debate over the atomic bomb that if we were able to use a weapon of mass destruction against a civilian or military target to send a message to another power who's our ally, that is war criminality. That is a war crime for us to 
target someone else in order to send a message to a different group. Okay, if you want to send a message, you target the group you're intending. Okay, so if you are going to make the argument that by dropping the atomic bombs, we're trying to uh, show some force to the Soviet Union, you're a war criminal. But let's look at it from Truman's perspective and see what kinds of factors were on his mind as it was leading up to August of 1945. One of the first factors is, I mean, if you're the president, what is your job? Your job is not to protect citizens of a foreign country. Your job is not to help the enemy in war. Your job is to fight this thing to the end and to save American lives. And that's what's at stake here. Yes, Japan has been bombed into obliteration and they're facing an absolute terrible loss here, but the American military casualties at places like Iwo Jima or at Okinawa, where we saw a one-to-one -one ratio of a killed to loss ratio, if you're the American president, you obviously want to try and prevent those those kinds of losses for our American citizens. Now, another thing that's on his mind is the policy of unconditional surrender. If the United States sent the Potsdam Declaration to Japan saying you will face prompt and utter destruction if you don't surrender right now, and then we didn't follow through with that, how would the United States look as a global leader after this moment? Probably not very good. Also, something to consider is there are emerging problems with the Soviet Union right now. Um, the Cold War is on the way. The Iron Curtain is going to fall. We're not going to talk about that right now, but let's just say that the Soviets are an issue of concern. So could the bombs be used in an effort to show Joseph Stalin who's got the real power? You can make that argument. But does that make you a war criminal to target potentially innocent civilians in order to send a message to someone else? Technically, that files under the rules of war criminality in the International Court of Law. Now, a hint as to a possible motive there was that Truman in his diary said that the atomic bomb is a potential ace up my sleeve to use against Stalin. That could make you a war criminal, Truman. Another thing, too, is consider the destructive power of the atomic bomb. If you're the president, you know the effectiveness of this thing could destroy an entire city. You haven't seen it be used on a city yet. So in many ways, could this be a science experiment? Maybe, which makes it criminal. Another thing too is as the president, he is certainly dealing with the moral weight of if I drop this, this will kill civilians who may have nothing to do with this conflict except for the fact that they are in harm's way in a government that's at war with us. But American values must be upheld. Pearl Harbor was attacked. Americans were attacked. Innocent civilians died, and certainly our military men have died as well. Now, the Americans that were surveyed in 1945, over 70% agreed that Emperor Hirohito should be, if not killed, he must at least be removed from power. Now, that's interesting to think about, because if you fast forward to the end of this war and after the dropping of the atomic bombs, who stays in power as a figurehead of Japan? Emperor Hirohito. So are we really living up to our American ideals by dropping the bombs and then allowing he Emperor Hirohito to stay in power? Maybe not. Also, there's that possibility of a Japanese surrender. The Japanese have not surrendered to Truman, but they are talking about it. They are making some moves to potentially do that. But while Truman waits and twiddles his thumbs waiting for a Japanese surrender, is there a chance that they could call it a conditional surrender where they get to keep things that we're not okay with? or? Could it also lead to more deaths? Think about the American POWs that are uh, facing death here at the hands of the Japanese in camps all throughout Japan as they're waiting for this war to end. Think of the story of Louis Zamperini, for instance, who was an American Olympian and then was a part of a crew that was shot down over the Pacific and then ended up in the hands of the Japanese and has been in a prisoner of war camp for years. And he is facing death by starvation and torture while he waits for the end of this war. Would waiting for a Japanese surrender be the right thing to do when there are over 130,000 POWs that could die while they wait for that surrender to take place? So at this point, Truman really has three options at hand. Number one is he could make this a time for peace. He could talk to the Japanese, say we need a discussive surrender possibility uh, with terms that we could, both can agree upon because of the fact that this war is so destructive and we don't want to see the death of any more people. Another thing he could do is take responsibility for a new era. He could say we have an atomic bomb. We're not going to keep it top secret. We will show you the power of this bomb by bombing an island, for instance, to show you what it can do. And
and then we will uh, move forward with this technology with us having the predominant say on how it is used and not to be used for a weapon of war, the way that the Chicago scientists, for instance, would have wanted him to do. And then another option is we use the bomb. We use the bomb as it was intended. We use multiple bombs if necessary to end this war as soon as possible. That's ultimately the decision facing Harry S. Truman. And of course, the decision he will make is to use the bomb. And the bomb is going to be used first against the city of Hiroshima. Hiroshima, up to this point, had not really been targeted at all by any kind of uh, American bombing campaigns. And so it was really an untouched city. It was uh, preserved throughout this war and therefore could be used as a good target because you could see the effectiveness of this bomb. Why not bomb Tokyo? It had already been mostly destroyed. So you wouldn't understand the effectiveness of this bomb unless you dropped it on a city that had been mostly untouched. Now the Americans did warn the Japanese citizens by airdropping leaflets throughout Japan across hundreds of cities, not just the ones that they will target, uh, to say you need to get out of the city as soon as possible. Your city will be bombed to destruction. Many Japanese refused to believe it because they figured it would not be the case, it would not actually happen. But the plane that's going to deliver this first bomb is the Enola Gay, and it will happen on August the 6th. Enola Gay is the name of a plane named after the pilot's mother. The pilot was Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts, and it was a B-29. Now this B-29 could not fly as, nor as high as it normally would because it was weighed down by this huge bomb. So when they were flying uh, and they dropped the bomb, it actually gave them a tremendous lift from the lack of weight and allowed them to get out of there just in the nick of time before it destroyed their plane from the repercussive effect of the explosion of this first bomb. The bomb was called Little Boy. And when the bomb was dropped, it went into this process where the bomb went into free fall. As the bomb fell, it went into a three-part explosion process. As it is falling through the air, there is a trigger mechanism that ignites the core that causes the atoms to start to rapidly split. As they split within milliseconds, it creates this giant explosion. The explosion takes place several hundred feet off the ground, therefore making the impact of the explosion even greater upon the ground and all of the things that are within the blast radius. This blast creates a massive fireball and a shock wave that will level buildings and crush people beneath the rubble if they're not completely liquidated themselves. Part two of the explosion is an intense heat wave which contains thermal radiation, making the, the blast zone 900 times hotter than the surface of the sun. It's so hot, in fact, that people that are within one kilometer of the blast are completely burned to death. Their eyeballs are turned to liquid. Some of them are completely vaporized. People that are caught in a blast area from one to three kilometers away would have their skin completely melted off. The third part of this explosion is where all of the debris and human material that's consumed in the blast will turn into a giant mushroom cloud and then will spread throughout the atmosphere and create what's called a black rain. This rain will rain radioactive material all over the area, spreading it not just from the blast area, but across much of Japan, bringing with it the radiation and the death. Now, the long-term effects of this blast usually lead to cancer, death, and birth deformities caused by the manipulation of the genetic code, your DNA. Little Boy killed 80,000 people in the initial blast, and then another 60,000 people from the effects of this bomb. The explosion was so much so that many people didn't believe it was even possible. I mean, the tail gunner from the Enola Gay looked out at this scene and captured that famous picture you just saw, and he said it's like a peep into hell. As this explosion takes place, there's a lot of shock, obviously, and, the, and Hirohito's government didn't believe it actually happened. They said that there's no way that a single plane could have dropped a, one bomb that would destroy an entire city. There's simply no way. They didn't think it was physically possible because nothing like this had ever happened before. So they waited, and they argued, and they debated. Finally, it'll be brought to a vote, and Hirohito finds that the war council is going to be split 50-50 once again. As he is deciding whether or not he needs to just step forward and end this war on his own, Russia declared war on August the 8th. Now remember that if Russia declared war, Japan figured it was done, that it couldn't keep fighting. So could we have waited? Even if the first bomb was justified, could Truman have waited for the second bomb and not dropped the second bomb and waited to see what the Japanese reaction would be to a Soviet declaration of war? Could he have waited and saved hundreds of thousands of lives? Maybe, but he chose not to. 
because he wanted to make sure that there was a rapid succession of bombs to make it clear that the Americans had an infinite arsenal of bombs that they could use, even though we didn't. We really only had three more left. So Fat Man is going to be the next bomb. It will destroy Nagasaki. Nagasaki was a religious site for the Japanese, and so it had an even bigger impact upon them culturally because this cultural symbol had been destroyed, and so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. About 80,000 people were killed in Nagasaki, and it was slightly less than Hiroshima because of the fact that there were hills around Nagasaki that made the blast somewhat less effective. Now, survivors of these things will become to known as Hibakusha. So Tomo Yamaguchi had this crazy experience of witnessing both atomic blasts and surviving both. You see, he lived in Nagasaki, and his family was in Nagasaki, but he was in Hiroshima on August the 6th for business. As the bomb went off, he was just outside of that one-mile blast radius and suffered severe burns and radiation poisoning. And so he got on a train after being checked out by doctors, and he went straight to Nagasaki and arrived in Nagasaki just in time for the second bomb to go off and miraculously survived that one as well. He will outlive his family members who will die from the effects of the atomic bombs, and he will live to tell his story, as will many other Hibakusha who talk about the terribly destructive aspect of this war in general, and the bomb in particular. Japan, on August the 10th, is going to surrender. Hirohito is going to declare to his war ministers that there is no way they're going to continue fighting. He will step forward and say, I'm ending this war now. I don't care what you have to say. Come what may, we're ending this thing. Remember that Hirohito is going to be allowed to be kept as emperor. Even though this guy is like the ultimate war criminal in this entire war, because he kept an eye on all of these things, he knew about all of these terrible atrocities that were being committed by groups like Unit 731, and yet did nothing to stop it. He really is the ultimate war criminal. But that's not who we're putting on trial. We're putting Harry S. Truman on trial for war criminality, and we'll get into that debate here a little later. But September the 2nd is when this finally ends. And it will end because the, the War Council of Japan will have to go and sign the declaration saying the war is now over and that Japan will be occupied by American forces. They'll have to sign this peace treaty aboard the USS Missouri. Now, why the Missouri? Well, the Missouri was attacked during Pearl Harbor. It was significantly wounded and nearly destroyed, but the Americans were able to fix it just in time to bring it here to Tokyo so that their war machine would end and they would have to sign this document ending the war on the Missouri. Another symbolic thing that they did is as the Japanese warriors were signing uh, the life of their country away, a fleet of B-17s and B-29s flew low right over the heads of the Japanese so much so that the entire ship and the entire area was shaking and you could feel the reverberation. A third and final piece of relevant symbolism here is this flag. Back in the 1850s, when Admiral Matthew Perry first opened up Japan and forced them with a little thing called gunboat diplomacy to be an ally trading partner of the United States, he flew that flag. Now, they kept that flag, and they had it aboard the USS Missouri to be overlooking the Japanese as they signed away the life of their country. Okay, Japan's going to be occupied by General Douglas MacArthur and the U.S. military for the next several decades. Hirohito, while he is emperor, will be only a figurehead. This really is a crushing blow to the Japanese that will witness the next several decades of American occupation and the destruction of their culture as they knew it from before World War II. It's a very interesting way to end this war. Now, Keep in mind that as we look at the end of this war and debate the effectiveness or the, the necessary aspects of the bomb, questions to consider here, should long-term effects be taken into consideration before using this kind of weapon on what could be a very civilian population? Maybe there were military men there as well. Certainly you can look that up in your research, but it was a very civilian target as well. Should that be taken into account? Another thing, too, is that should our nation, which claims a lot of it is Christian, um, use the just war theory when making considerations of war? And I know you can make the argument of how evil the Japanese military was. Absolutely. But should we bring ourselves down to that level in order to end this conflict on our terms? 
And what about the Geneva Conventions? While the United States is seen around the world as this leader of taking care of citizens, promoting de democracy, and, and preventing this illegal war criminal kind of activity, again, going back to what Robert McNamara said, what makes it moral if you win, but immoral if you lose? Now, that's something that we're going to be debating in our mock trial and researching leading up to that. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say in regards to this issue. Thanks for watching.